Hello and welcome to episode 42 of Question and Answer. I am your host, Ponyo Bossa, and this is your co-host, Adelaide. She is the new dog in this house, and she's a very nice dog, although she's got like one pale blue eye that kind of reminds me of something out of an Edgar Allan Poe story. But, ah, be that as it may, we've got lots of questions. And so I'm just going to wade right into this. And the first question is from, I believe, he's called Yuichiro. And Yuichiro says, I read an article by a right-wing traditionalist complaining that modern movie heroes hesitate to kill their enemies and show mercy. And this is apparently libtard propaganda. I don't like Marvel movies, but I don't see this as particularly bad morals. It seems to be promoting compassion. However, I can also see the argument for warriors carrying out their duty no matter what and just killing their enemies without a second thought, like Krishna told Arjuna. Which one would be better morals in your opinion? Okay, well, I mean, the good guys not wanting to kill the bad guys isn't something new. I think Roy Rogers in like the really old black and white movies wouldn't shoot any of the bad guys. He would just lasso them off their horse and just incapacitate them until they got arrested or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously from a Buddhist point of view, from the point of view of Buddhist morals, um, not killing is better than killing. So if you're getting to the point of like a, a samurai warrior just killing out of a sense of honor and duty, um, that's amoral. That's that's not so much moral as just being um, efficiently amoral, I think. So, yeah, definitely from the point of view of Buddhist morals, not killing is preferable to killing, regardless of of who you are or what the circumstances are. And that's one reason why um, the most serious Buddhists are supposed to be monks who renounce the world and don't have a woman and children that they have to defend and so they can just saint just in a saintly manner let themselves be killed without without killing the guy who's trying to kill them so i guess that answer has been that question has been answered so i'll just move on to the next one as the puppy snarfs on my hand okay next question from uh, yuichiro is as follows, a libtard Buddhist friend, libtard Buddhist friend of mine said he reached jhana while being a layman and only meditating half an hour a day. I'm skeptical, however, he's not the type to lie. Do you think this is possible or likely? Well, the odds against it are pretty high, but I mean, it is possible. Even if you've got like a 0.1% chance, you've got a thousand people doing something, that means just going with statistics, one out of a thousand would uh, succeed. So there is a good chance that if this person is honest and thinks that he's got jhana just from meditating half an hour a day, it's possible, and this is often the case, that he had some kind of strange experience and just assumed that it was jhana. Or he went into like a, like a trance state and just... Uh, just thought that it was Jonah. And I think, like like I've said many times on, on my various videos, probably most people in Burma, which is a devoutly Theravada Buddhist country, um, they really can't tell the difference between jhana and like a auto-hypnosis. So it may be that the person just went into a trance state and just assumed that it's jhana, but really doesn't know enough about jhana to be able to tell whether it's really jhana or not. But, I mean, without really um, meeting this person or talking with this person, then, you know, it, it's possible. It's, it's not entirely, it's not completely impossible. Somebody, some people have parami, which means that, um, from a Buddhist point of view, they have cultivated, um, like, virtues over past lives. And so they just are born with a certain amount of talent. And I've met people that just really have meditative talent. They're just really good at it naturally. So they could be one of those people too, despite being a libtard. So 
I guess I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Jess. And Jess says, what evidence is there that Buddha's experience of nirvana wasn't just a hallucination or made up entirely? It seems most Buddhists I encounter have already drunk the Kool-Aid and are not capable of objective rational criticism, criticism after a while in the religion. It seems the oral and monastic tradition meant to preserve the teaching has become very cult-like over time. Well, the oral and monastic tradition, I don't think has become particularly cult-like, although some, some Buddhist groups can be cult-like. Like, um, even though I think the Goenka method um, it has been the most successful at spreading Dhamma in the West, like genuine Dhamma, still, I mean, they can be pretty cult-like. So there is that. But with regard to the question here, what evidence is there that Buddha's experience of nirvana wasn't just a hallucination or made up entirely? Well, I mean, it, technically it wasn't even an experience. I mean, nirvana, it's, it's, you're getting into uh, questionable territory, uh, even referring to you know, somebody's experience of nirvana because nirvana is completely off the scale. And if you read texts like the, the Ataka Waga of the Sutta Nipata, you know that, I mean, you, you dismiss any kind of mental state. Like, uh, like a serious meditator who's going for, for enlightenment, you just let go of every mental state. It says in the Sutta Nipata or in the, in the Ataka Waga, you just, you know, just let go of all perceptions, you know, just anything. And so, with that kind of a view, I don't think that you would confuse nirvana with a hallucination. If, I mean, any kind of perception is, is dismissed as not it, then, I mean, if you, if you read some of these texts, it's very sophisticated. And there's no way to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Buddha was truly enlightened. There's no way to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that anybody is truly enlightened. So um, you just go with the evidence of the texts, just the subtlety and sophistication of the explanations or instructions on how to become enlightened, how to attain Nibbana, how to, I mean, whether it's even an experience or not is questionable. So the Buddha's uh, enlightenment is like an entirely different issue from um, most of the Buddhists that Jess encounters having uh, drunk the Kool-Aid and not being capable of objective criticism of their, of their, their system, their, their religion or whatever it is. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from, I think it's pronounced a vanity. And this is in response to the previous Q and A where, Somebody asked me if I'd seen Fight Club, and I, I mentioned that I have seen it. It's one of my favorite movies. It's in my top ten, but not in my top three, although it's it's close. You know, it might be number four or five. But um, let's see, what are my top three favorite movies? Well, I should just say that they're all um, like romance dramas. Like there's this movie... I like uh, touch me, feel me about the deaf mute ballerina who falls in love with the choreographer and stuff. But I wouldn't, I won't be that cruel to the person who commented and saying, please don't say that it's, it's romance and dramas that are in your top three. So my first, my favorite movie of all time would be Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Number two would be The Matrix, and number three would be Apocalypse Now but not the redux version, like the original movie version of Apocalypse Now, like without the French plantation. And I'm sure the Playboy bunnies are very nice, but like the prolonged scene with the Playboy bunnies um, and the dog is chewing on my finger, as you can see. Um, but yeah, the original, the original version of, uh, of Apocalypse Now would be number three, I think. So, and I suppose one thing they all have in common, they're all philosophical movies. You might think that Monty Python and Holy Grail isn't philosophical, but I mean, it's self-referential, which in a way makes it philosophical. Like there's, 
the there's the guy like um they meet this guy who's referred to as the man from scene 23 or something like that like inside the in the movie you know they're talking about it's the man from scene 23 but i'll just move on i don't need to keep talking about this this is the next one is from mary spelled m-e-r-r-y and this question i think is a trick question he says for q a number 42 i want the answer to life the universe and everything and i think that comes from the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where like the answer to life the universe and everything is like number 42 but um I'm, I'm very skeptical. I've, from the very beginning, I've been very skeptical of the idea that the answer to life, the universe, and everything would be a number. Unless maybe it's like the number one or the number zero. But um, yeah, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Let's, let's just go with dependent core rising, Paticca Samupada. And uh, I've talked about that at length recently on another video. So I'll just move on to Fred's next question. And that is, who is Fred? The guy is amazing. Quicker than me, I see his comments on Twitter, YouTube, everywhere. The guy is my hero. I mean, I am creepy, but that guy is just a whole another level, Mary says. And Fred, he's, he's just uh, a supporter and uh, fan of my, my videos, my channel, I guess. And uh, he lives in New Zealand. And I really don't know a whole lot about him, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he lives in New Zealand. So you can uh, go with that. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is, I like this question. I mean, I pretty much like all questions, but every once in a while you get one that's kind of interesting, one that I've never had to answer before. And uh, this one is kind of one of those. Lucid says, what do you think of the so-called Buddhist tooth and mystic relics in general? Well, there's more than one Buddhist tooth. There's like the famous one in Sri Lanka. They've got the temple of the, the sacred tooth or something there. And um, I was, ow, she's biting my ear. I was told that, uh, or I read, <laughs> that when the Portuguese uh, colonized parts of, of Sri Lanka, one of the first things they did in their in, in their like religious intolerance is they publicly smashed the tooth there. And within like 24 hours, somehow the tooth had miraculously respawned, which um, it's, I mean, that in itself is kind of suspicious to me. But I have seen a, a, a replica of the other canine tooth. Both of these are supposed to be like the, the canine teeth of the Buddha. And uh, I saw a replica of the Chinese one. There's one in China. And the Chinese sent this tooth. Um, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a replica. Um, so, yeah, forget the part about me seeing a replica. We'll get to the replica part in, in a little bit. But they, they lent this tooth to uh, Burma and I went and looked at it when it was in Rangoon and it was about this big and it had several little root things on one, one end and the other end was just kind of beveled. And my guess is, I mean, the, the whole tooth was like this big, it was a big tooth. And my guess is it's like from some kind of rhinoceros, maybe a taper, you know, some kind of, some kind of animal that, is not a human being. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of any Buddha's tooth relic, but what the, Bur the Burmese just took it very seriously. And um, they built a pagoda largely with slave labor, I have, I have read, um, to, to house a, a replica of this you know, like five, six inch long rhinoceros tooth or whatever it was. I mean, it obviously did not look like any human tooth. So what do I think of the so-called Buddha's tooth? I think they're probably fake. Um, I mean, the Buddha was cremated. And uh, I, I mean, I have seen what are likely to be some of the remains from the cremation. And they were just like little pieces of charred bone. I don't know if any teeth survived. 
But uh, the next part of this question is, what is, what do I think of mystic relics in general? Well, as I just mentioned, I have seen the Peshawar relics in Mandalay, and um, I was kind of in a state of mild awe, I guess, actually seeing a part of Gautama Buddha himself, or what is likely to be um, a genuine relic of the Buddha himself. Um, so, you know, it can inspire a certain amount of, you know, respect or awe or devotion or something like that. But I don't think that they have any magical powers other than just what the people around them, you know, impose upon them. I mean, like, you believe in something fervently enough, then miracles can happen. And so I'm sure that the relics, including fake ones, have inspired enough devotion and just sort of fanaticism that like miraculous things have happened like healings and so forth and now the puppy is like getting under my arm and so i'll just move on to the next question and this is from austin and she's like licking it's, oh now she's behind me Ugh. puppies are like that you know so the next question is from austin and Austin says, oh, she snarfed in my ear so bad. Austin says, I was discussing my interest in, <laughs> I was discussing my interest, I was discussing my interest in Buddhism with a Vietnamese Christian friend who shared with me his perspective that Buddhism could lead to social stagnation. He explained that if everyone were to become a monk, it would cause societal collapse. Do you believe that Christian societies operate on a more effective system for generating wealth than Buddhist societies? Well, that's, that's kind of, first of all, it's like a facile kind of a bogus argument, it seems to me. And also it points out just how corrupt Christianity, oh, how corrupt Christianity has become. Just a second, we've got to reposition this dog. My earlobe is just too close to her mouth. So first of all, um, this person says that Buddhism could lead to social stagnation because if everyone were to become a monk, it would cause societal collapse. Well, yeah, I've heard that many times before, and it's just a plain fact that not everyone's going to become a monk or a nun. It's always going to be a tiny amount of people who are doing that. And so it's just kind of a bogus argument. But with regard to Christianity, I mean, Christianity used to be pretty, I mean, it's like, Woe unto the rich, you know, gather not up your treasures upon the earth, sell all that you have, give the money to the poor and follow me. It's just the, the Bible is full of this stuff, you know, it's like love of money is a form of idolatry and that stuff just gets ignored. And it's, it's ignored by most Buddhists also, like it's strictly against the rules for monks to handle money. And I guess there's a, a question a little farther down that addresses that particular issue and 98% of Asian monks, or let's be charitable and call it 95% of monks, um, of Theravada Buddhist monks, just go ahead and handle money anyway. And that's the way with Christians. I mean, the Bible says you're supposed to be poor, and Christians just don't want to do that. So I suppose, like, corrupt Christianity it may be a more effective system for generating wealth. But then again, if you're truly spiritual, generating wealth is not really a priority. Voluntary poverty is considered to be a virtue by biblical Christianity and from uh, Orthodox Theravada Buddhism, from, from the point of view of both. And I think I'm going to put the dog down. Hey, you go in here. Oh, there you go. Okay, so, um, yeah, with regard to this question by Austin, first of all, you know, it's just not going to happen that most people, or let alone everybody, is going to become an ordained monk or nun, which causing societal collapse, because monks aren't even allowed to feed themselves. They've got to be supported by lay people. And I'm showing my sophistication by using paper umbrellas now. And, uh, yeah, Christianity was just as hard on, on the, the keeping of money 
as early Buddhism was. Oh, you want back out, do you? Here, let's just put you down here. Oh. There you go there. There you go. Um, yeah, like, like it says that Jesus told his disciples, you know, not to carry money. Although I think there's uh, some ambiguity in the New Testament. I think there's other scenes where, where they do handle money. But um, yeah, I would, I would just consider this argument to be somewhat facile. There have been prosperous Buddhist countries like, uh, you know, the, the Mauryan Empire under Ashoka, who apparently was fairly prosperous. Um, and that was, it was Buddhist. So, but any, any culture that's going to be profoundly spiritual, I mean, the, the making of money, economic prosperity is not going to be nearly as much of a priority as, you know, some sort of spiritually bankrupt Protestantism or something where um, people are just ignoring certain parts of the Bible that are inconvenient in order to make as much money as they can. So, I think I'll just move on to Austin's next question. Let's see. Austin says, I understand that lying is a fundamental principle in Buddhism to refrain from, but there are some people that cannot take unvarnished truth without being severely damaged in emotional well-being. What should be done about this if consequentially people suffer less from white lies? Well, I mean, you're still lying, even if it's a white lie. So, I mean, you should either tell the truth or remain silent. Um, although, I mean, uh, I was talking about this in a previous, the, the, the previous Q&A, you know, giving an example of how, you know, if telling a lie might save somebody's life or something like that. Um, I mean, it's a judgment call. It's still going to be immoral. It's still going to be unethical to lie, but it may be the lesser of two evils. So in a case like that, but if you're just trying to spare somebody's feelings, I mean, that's, that's a judgment call also. You know, like, uh, let's say your woman gets her hair cut really short and dyed purple and asks you how it looked. And I mean, you've got to live under the same roof with her. You might have to uh, kind of fudge things a little bit. But nevertheless, I mean, it is best to tell the truth um, if possible. And I remember Paul Lowe saying once that if everyone just told the unvarnished truth, that, you know, like hypocrisy and, and, and white lies and all that were gone, just lying out of politeness, you know, like, I'd like to come, but I'm busy, when actually you just don't want to come. That kind of thing. I mean, that's just common. That's that's just very, very common. But as I was saying, Paul Lowe once said that if everybody just started telling the truth, telling what they really think, it would just, like, civilization would just blow up. You know, it would just be like chaos, just mayhem for maybe two weeks or so. And then by the time the dust finally settled, the civilization would be operating at a higher level of consciousness. But um, there was a famous saying I just read just recently. I can't remember who said it, though. It's like, you know, if, if the truth hurts them, then let them hurt. Something, something along those lines. I think it was like Ben Franklin or somebody who said that. But, I mean, to some degree, you have to have compassion. But still, if you lie, I mean, you are lying and, you know, you, you take responsibility for that. So, at the very least, it should be the lesser of two evils. So I'll just move on to the next question. Also from Austin. And Austin says, have you ever witnessed a monk harnessing psychic powers? And is it permissible to discuss such matters? I understand that within the monastic community, discussing magical powers is prohibited. Well, technically it's not exactly prohibited. It's just that a monk is not allowed to admit to having psychic powers to a lay person. I mean, amongst themselves, monks can talk about it, although even then it's probably not the best. Um, so, I mean, the rule is against a monk discussing superhuman mental states, especially his own, to lay people, to unordained people. That is against the rules. So, I mean, even if he does have jhana, if he admits to having jhana to a lay person, he's still broken a rule. 
it's not nearly as bad of a rule as if he lies to a lay person saying that he's got John on when he really doesn't. That's excommunication. That's that's one of the worst things a monk can possibly do. Uh, so, um, have I ever witnessed a monk harnessing psychic powers? I don't think so. I, I've never really hung out with uh, miracle working monks. Um, I've met a few that had a reputation for doing that. And sometimes you, you can't really tell. I mean, um, you meet some monk and he's, he's looking at you intently for, for all you know. He might be reading your mind, but he doesn't say anything about it. So something like that. But my understanding of psychic powers among spiritual practitioners is not a matter of harnessing it. It's just that synchronicity and just weird stuff happens spontaneously around certain people. Um, and, and it's not a matter of them like deliberately doing it. They just might be talking off the top of their head and it's just as though you know, it's intended for one person in particular, you know, they've got some deep down issue they have to deal with and they have to, they have to hear that particular thing in order to like open this door inside them or something. Uh, so, and it just happens spontaneously, just, you know, the, the flow of karma or something is enhanced around certain people. And I, I've heard anecdotal stories about like Weibu Seattle. Um, you know, he would, know in advance when people are going to show up and this was back before cell phones or anything like that he would just start you know he'd tell the people to get ready because we're going to have visitors soon and you know he'd give details and then they you know lo and behold they show up or um it not not just things like that but i mean i have heard stories about weibu seattle having these psychic powers but he died before i ever went to burma uh, Shui Um in Seattle apparently could read minds or reportedly could read minds. I met him once, but he wasn't obviously reading my mind while I was talking with him. So I guess I should just move on to Austin's next question. And he says, What should I do about the limited availability of genuine Buddhist teachings in my area? Although there are a few zendos nearby where I can practice meditation, one of them requires a subscription fee to access the Dhamma, which seems contradictory to Buddhist principles. The other Zendo has suspended their sitting practice due to COVID, and the head instructor, who is a Roshi, has been removed from the Zen community for engaging in sexual misconduct. I'm uncertain of where to turn for authentic Buddhist guidance and practice. I visited a Theravada Wat, but unfortunately, nobody there spoke English or engaged with me. It appeared that the primary focus of the community was on providing meals to the monks and performing repetitive walkings around the temple. I didn't feel a sense of connection or engagement with the community. And then, uh, as an update in parentheses, he says, uh, I went to a new Wat today and had the pleasure of meeting a very friendly monk. We had a great conversation about Dhamma for about an hour, and he kindly invited me to come and meditate any time. Additionally, he invited me to join him for Maga Puja, which was a wonderful experience. So to some degree, I think Austin's predicament has been uh, alleviated somewhat. But uh, the main question is the very first sentence up here. What should I do about the limited availability of genuine Buddhist teachings in my area? Well, I mean, you have access to the entire Pali Tipitaka. It's on the internet. You can buy hard bound or, you know, hard copies of it. So that should really be the, uh, the like the the gold standard for for Dhamma and uh, genuine Buddhist teachings is just read the original texts in good translations, and then if you hear a Dhamma teacher, uh, you compare what he's saying with the books, you know, like Dhamma books, you know the ancient ones that resonate deeply with you. So if you can't find a really good teacher, like a flesh and blood one, then, uh, I mean, you always have recourse to the Dhamma. Like the Buddha, before he died, said that, you know, after he is, after he is gone, the Dhamma will be the teacher. So uh, get a good copy of the Sutta Nipata, for example, or the, the Majjhima Nikaya. 
<clears throat> so I think uh, I assume that's a good enough quest answer to the question. So I'll move on to Austin's next question. And Austin says, is living as a layperson better than living as a monk? I noticed that you seem healthier and happier now that you're in a loving relationship and have access to amenities such as food and a gym whenever you want, which may not be readily available to monks who lead a more austere and contemplative lifestyle. Um, is living as a layperson better than living as a monk? It depends on what you want out of life, I suppose. Um, being a monk is, is unnatural. You know, being a celibate monk who eats once a day, doesn't have a home, doesn't, you know, supposedly, ideally, doesn't really have a family, who's like going alone like the horn of the rhinoceros, maybe not even knowing where he's going to sleep each night, not knowing what he's going to eat every day. It's, it's really unnatural. And then you add on top of that, just the, all the rules that have to be followed and just the meditation. Um, and it puts a real strain on people. And, and I mean, monks are no exception. I think uh, one of the reason why like famous saints wind up having like horrible diseases and so forth is just it causes such a strain on the system that it causes an imbalance, which then can result in health problems. Um, some people just imposed health problems on themselves. You know, like there was uh, some some French woman in the Middle Ages. Uh, she didn't get canonized, but she was beatified. And I mean, she would just eat tiny amounts of bread that was so tough that it would cause her mouth to bleed when she was eating it. And one time she got so sick that the doctor told her she had to eat meat and she ate the meat. But then later she compensated by cutting an equal amount of flesh off of her own leg and this kind of stuff. I mean, when you get to that extreme, obviously you're not going to be a healthy person, but even just living the life of a monk is unnatural for most people. I mean, some people, they're just some, some men, for example, it just comes natural to them that they don't have a relationship. You know, they're just naturally don't have much of a sex drive. They don't have social instincts. They just like living a simple life alone and just meditating and chilling out all the time. And they might get along fine, but um, just living a more natural life is more conducive to, you know, having like a healthy flow of energy going through you, being healthier in general. Um, I used to have like bad skin, for example, like blotchy skin when I was a monk and that's pretty much gone away, uh, due to my, uh, more natural and just having more love in my life. I suppose that, that probably does, is a contributing factor. So, but then again, I mean, if you want Nirvana or you really want to live up to these exalted ideals, then, I mean, there's always going to be a trade-off. There's always going to be a price, you know? So it's like the disadvantages are, you know, like the unnatural strain on your, your, your mind and your body. But it, the advantages are, you know, you're, you're chilled out, your mind is clearer and, um, you know, you're, you're more, more likely to get insight, like deep insight. Plus you, you can just meditate all day. So, um, whether it's better living as a lay person or living as a monk depends on what it is you want out of life. So I'll just move on to Austin's next question. And Austin says, I heard a professor say this about Buddhism quote, Buddhism is concerned with the problem of solving suffering. So the first axiom is always, we don't want to suffer here already. I have problems. If there is any point of psychoanalysis, it's that we want to suffer, unquote. Thoughts on this? Well, it is true that people don't become enlightened, not, not simply because they're not trying hard enough to become enlightened. It's that they're trying all the time to remain unenlightened. And it is true. People want to suffer for various reasons. Partly it's just force of habit, a lifelong habit of being miserable you just kind of identify with that. That's like who you are. And if you stopped being that miserable, it would be like a part of you was dying because that's become like a part of your personality, like a part of who you identify with. So there is that. And also, 
um, if you're living like especially a worldly kind of life, there's there's going to be happiness and unhappiness. I mean, you can't just have one without the other. You know, they're, they're, they're going to remain in balance. It's, so it's, it's like a roller coaster ride, whereas a monk is just going for like flat, you know, smooth sailing. You know, there's just neutrality. You know, he's avoiding pleasure as well as pain, or at least just trying to be relatively indifferent to pleasure as well as pain. Um, but with the monk who's, you know, trying to um, eradicate suffering, then uh, it, it, I mean, he's got to be serious about it. And, um, you know, a monk who becomes or a person who becomes enlightened isn't like the per people that this professor is talking about how people want to suffer. I mean, most people do. But then again, most people don't become enlightened. And uh, also, uh, Buddhism as a path to the end of suffering, that's kind of like a heart oriented approach to Buddhism. There's also a more head oriented approach, which is the approach I generally took. And that is that you're not trying to eradicate suffering, you're trying to eradicate delusion. And it's essentially the same path. But um, I think some head oriented professor like this might have a better appreciation for um, a spiritual path aimed at the eradication of delusion. And if you eradicate delusion, you eradicate suffering also because the suffering comes from delusion. So there is that. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Z123. And Z123 says, what's your Insta ID? Can you help me? Well, I've, I've never been on Instagram. I don't, I don't do Instagram. So I don't have an Insta ID as far as I know. And this, can you help me? I assume that just means, can I help Z123 by giving my Insta ID? And in that case, no, but in other ways, maybe, maybe I can help you. If you have, you know, questions about Dhamma, I can, I can help you with that, I suppose. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Johannes. And Johannes says, do you have any idea why your Samadhi didn't improve anymore after a certain point? Have you tried doing the Tonga? So that's two questions. So the first question is, um, I've, I've explained, you know, why I stopped being a monk and the number one reason, like the first one that kind of spawned any subsequent reasons was I just stopped making progress for years. I stopped making progress. Probably the, the best meditation of my life was around 2004, or at least the best meditation of my life ended around 2004. And so Johannes here is asking if I have any idea why it didn't improve anymore. Um, I am not sure. Possibly, um, like I've said, I've just got as far as I could with it. It's like maybe, you know, that was just sort of my limit. Maybe, you know, just karma, you know, paramis, like I mentioned. Um, also, there's just like this... Um, imbalance this strain that I was under that uh, I mentioned just a, a few minutes ago that just living a monastic life causes this strain and imbalance or it can and uh, that was just becoming like a hindrance um, so yeah also just um, I burned out on Burma and but then coming back to America wasn't really working very good for someone wanting to live the life of a monk in Burma. You can live the life of a monk almost exactly like it says in the in the text. You can just wander around. You go into a village with your bowl. People put food in. You don't have to use, you know, electricity or anything. You know, it's, it doesn't really get cold enough to be lethal in the tropics. You don't have bills to pay. Then you come back to America and it's, it's just really difficult to, to live, um, you know, as, as a monk is supposed to live in the texts. And I mean, you can, there are ways of kind of approximating it. There are ways that a monk can live in the West without actually breaking rules, but you're living almost like a prisoner. So th th that was kind of a factor also. But um, yeah, I think my samadhi didn't improve after a certain point. It was just the the struggle, the strain of just having to 
to try as hard as you can with very limited results, very sporadic, unpredictable results, eventually your beginner's mind and your enthusiasm for practice start to wane. So that, that's also a factor. But uh, I guess I should just move on to the, the second part of Johannes's question here. Have I ever tried doing Dutanga? Yeah, yeah, I, I did lots of Dutangas. Um, I tried not to make a deal, tried not to make a big deal out of doing Dutangas. Like for years and years, um, I did the, the one meal a day stuff and it's uh, the, one, the one sitting. Although sometimes like in the middle of my meal, I would stand up take a step to the left, take a step back to the right, sit back down and finish my meal just so I wouldn't technically be practicing the Dutanga of eating in one sitting every day. Um, I, I sat, I, I never lay down for more than a year. That was when I was a junior monk. I had to pretty much stop the sitter's practice, just sleeping in a sitting position. Um, when I got to Burma and it was, it was so hot that I just found out that just sleeping spread eagle on a concrete floor was the coolest way of sleeping. And so I just started doing that. You sleep leaning back against something, it just gets just foul with sweat. So yeah, I did, I did quite a lot of Dutanga. And monks aren't really supposed to talk about that, but I'm not a monk anymore. So yeah, I practiced uh, quite a lot of Dutanga. <sighs> So I think I'll just move on to Johannes's next question. And the puppy wants to bite my ear some more, don't you? Yeah, here, there it is. So Johannes's next question. Do you think spiritual progress is even possible without a Sangha? Or at least without spiritual friends who are going down the same road? I'm currently all alone in nature. Oh. <laughs> Maybe picking up the dog was not the best idea. Okay, I'm currently all alone in nature, living on a cherry orchard, and honestly, sometimes meditating seems to disturb me more than just focusing on all the tasks at hand and being a kind person. Is it, idi oh. Is it idiotic to think that we can just power through and get it over with the practice all by ourselves, and wouldn't it be just be better to try and focus on being a good human with a good heart. I'm thinking here of the Sanleka Sutta, quote, it is impossible here, Chunda, that quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, some bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. He might think thus, I am abiding in effacement, but it is not these attainments that are called effacement in the noble one's discipline. These are called pleasant abidings here and now in the Noble One's Discipline. Now, Chunda, here effacement should be practiced by you. Others will be cruel. We shall not be cruel here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will kill living beings. We shall abstain from killing, killing living beings here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will take what is not given. We shall abstain from taking what is not given here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Uh, let's see. Let's get up to the top here. Oh, okay, so the main point of the question here is Johannes is asking, um, is spiritual progress even possible without a Sangha, or at least without um, what in the Pali is called the Kalyana Mita, which is the, the good friend, the spiritual friend who is like your guide? Um, well, obviously, it is possible um, to make spiritual progress. Like, you know, you've got the son, Leka Sutta here, which he's is essentially um, aiming that particular passage towards uh, a lay person just following the five precepts apparently but um, uh, I mean you've got like the rhinoceros horn this this chorus you know go alone like the horn of the rhinoceros and I'm thinking I'm gonna put the dog back down again because she's being very frisky okay so yeah it is possible the main thing that you need a teacher for and I mean, this is another reason why I stopped making progress, I suppose. I just did not have a teacher that I could really trust and accept because I've, I've had bad karma with teachers. So this is sort of a, an answer to the above question that I was kind of meandering around with. 
is uh yeah i did not have like the good friend someone who who i could really want to be like that person you know it's like most of of my teachers were good-hearted monks asian monks but very very narrow-minded just very culturally conditioned with a very dogmatic approach that i just could not follow so i was thrown back on books as my main teachers and um the thing about a book is if if you're doing something wrong the book isn't just going to like speak up and say hey you're, you shouldn't be doing that so it is good to have a person who can point out your weak spots and that you trust enough that when they point out your weak spots you just don't get upset and then just say fuck you or whatever so that's the main um i mean some people they have enough of a social mentality that they can practice better when they're in a group like you might be shamed into not just getting up and walking away if you're in a meditation hall and everybody else is still sitting so you don't want to be the only person who just gets up and walks out just because your legs are tired or you're bored or you want to do something else but um yeah so having a spiritual teacher is important but it should be someone who i mean you you trust and someone you would want to be like presumably um and it's not necessarily easy because most spiritual teachers are relatively ignorant. You know, they're just common worldlings too. And uh, even the ones that have some attainment, it might be there's like this culture barrier where they're, you know, they're wise, but still they're just talking in accordance with their cultural conditioning and so forth. And it just may not resonate with you. So again, um, sometimes the best you can do is just read the ancient texts um, or just find somebody who writes things that really resonate with you, that, that really seem to be beneficial in waking you up. Uh, let's see. But, I mean, if you're just focusing on tasks at hand and, and being a kind person, it is kind of a worldly, I mean, you're, you're making good karma, you're earning merit. You know, that's the road to heaven more than it is the road to enlightenment. If you want enlightenment, I mean, it's, it's subtle. You're going to do a lot of meditation. And if you do have like an enlightened teacher or at least a very wise one, it can be helpful. So I'll just uh, move on to the next question by Johannes. His last question is, do you think there's a difference between working against your five hindrances in daily life and working against them in meditation? Um, it'd be a difference in degree, I think. A difference in degree rather than kind because I mean working against the hindrance in your daily life that's like the 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 rough work you know that's the the course adjust and working against them in meditation that's the fine tuning you know that's like um working against the five hindrances in daily life that's like using a chisel to carve a statue and then working against them in meditation is more like using the the, the sandpaper to finish the job so, I mean, both of them are doing essentially the same thing, although in meditation, you, you got more clarity and you can see the, the small stuff more easily. Whereas in, in daily life, you're dealing with the bigger, the bigger manifestations of, of your defilements, I suppose. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Eric. And Eric says, recently read an article where AI was generating Christian sermons with some folks claiming the work was soulless. What do you think AI-generated Buddhist sermons or discourses would be like? Well, it depends on the AI, I suppose. I mean, it wouldn't matter if a Buddhist sermon is soulless because the Buddhism teaches that there is no soul, at least not an ultimately real one. So... Um, yeah, I suppose or Jack Kerouac, possibly while he was drunk, wrote a, like a, a Mahayana Buddhist scripture, which reads like, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly wise. So I assume uh, like, a, you know, you program the AI well enough and uh, it should be able to come up with, um, you know, decent Buddhist sermons. Although, I mean, I doubt that AI is, is advanced enough to come up with anything original. Like the, the computer itself isn't going to have any insights. It's just going to be, you know, just regurgitating what's been programmed into it. You know, just kind of rearranging the sentences or something. But I, I really can't say. 
Um, I don't have a lot of experience. I guess there's some new AI program where you can, that will just like write scientific papers and, and, and that sort of thing, which is going to cause problems in schools where students are just having this AI write their papers for them. But um, again, I really, I really don't know what a, a Buddhist, I mean, it would just say the right things, but without any g actual insight backing it up. But I mean, some people, they just might need to hear the right things. And uh, the insight behind that may be largely irrelevant. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Conrad. And Conrad says, what is the Buddhist teaching about romantic love? If it causes a mental attachment, surely it is a cause of dukkha. But on the other hand, in theory, one could be deeply in love whilst practicing mental detachment. Is it possible to be married and live the life of a householder and also realize nirvana? Perhaps more difficult. If one wants to realize nirvana, is celibacy always necessary? Well, I mean, there are people who are claimed to be enlightened that are married. I mean, like there's, uh, what, Eckhart Tolle is married, I guess. Nisargadatta Maharaj was a layman who was married. He ran a little stall in India selling cigarettes and stuff. Um, but, I mean, with regard to Orthodox Theravada Buddhism, yeah, romantic love is not recommended by ancient Indian early Buddhism. And that's largely, I mean, not entirely, but largely because like early Theravada or even pre-Theravada Buddhism, it was very much a product of ancient Indian culture going all the way back to the Indus Valley civilization where it was sort of a pessimistic approach to this world where this world or samsara is a bad place. You want to just break all attachments and just get out of it. And early Buddhism teaches that. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism was becoming more liberal, I guess. And uh, like, um, what is it? The uh, Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, where Vimalakirti is this very advanced, practically enlightened bodhisattva who not only is married and has kids, but he's, he's going to like brothels and, and taverns and stuff. Um, but in early Buddhism, like romantic love is called Pema or, or Sneha. It's not the word Metta, which is more of a spiritual love. Like in, like in Christianity, you've got the three kinds of love. You've got Eros, Philos, and Agape. And Agape is the spiritual love. Eros is the sexual, romantic kind of love. And uh, Philos is, you know, brotherly love kind of a thing, or philosophical love. Um, in Buddhism, there's different kinds of love also. You know, metta is more of a spiritual or just kind of a friendliness, you know, just kind of wishing others well, that kind of a thing. And like the the erotic kind of stuff is, is called pema or, or sneha. And I think there's other words for it too. Um, but the, the main thing is um, with regard to the negative aspect of it is, first of all, um, I mean, it does increase desire and it, it increases pleasure, which means you're going to have more of the opposite to, to contend with. And so it's more distractions and more ups and downs. You know, you're not getting the smooth sailing that a monk is shooting for. So there is that. Also, you know, I mean, you're interacting with another person who is not entirely under your control, of course, who may be unpredictable. And I mean, that can be a positive or a negative. Because, I mean, if a lot of a lot of monks, like hermit types, like I was for a long time, it's, you just don't learn how to deal with other humans. You don't learn how to deal with, you know, somebody just throwing curveballs at you or knuckleballs or whatever. And um, you might need more personal interaction and feedback just, just to kind of keep you from drifting off into just weird eccentricities and so forth or just becoming really dysfunctional. So I think with a lot of people, um, like spiritual development while having a romantic relationship is probably the most realistic and it's most conducive to just living a natural, healthy life. 
um, I think they've done studies that show that people that are in a relationship tend to live longer than people who are solitary, that kind of a thing. But early Indian Buddhism, largely because of where it arose and the cultural conditioning, um, it, it, was, it takes a pretty dim view of romantic love. Although um, romantic love does have its good points and its bad points from a spiritual point of view. So let's see, let's see if I'm answering the whole question here. Oh, if it causes mental attachment, surely it is a cause of dukkha. But on the other hand, in theory, one could be deeply in love while practicing mental detachment. Yeah, in theory, but um, as a general rule, a woman wants you to be attached to her. Um, if you're just completely detached, where um, you know she could come or go and you don't care, or she could be faithful or unfaithful and you don't care. I mean, maybe if she's like really into spiritual practice also, but probably not even then, that she might be cool with that. So is it possible to be married and live the life of a householder and also realize nirvana? I think it is possible. It's probably more difficult. It's more challenging. You know, it's it's a more a more advanced setting to the video game. Um, just because one of the purposes of being a monk is to remove distractions and to just remove anything unnecessary, just strip down your life and simplify it radically so that you can just dedicate yourself full time to uh, cultivating wisdom and so forth. Whereas in a relationship, it's more like um, you're just surfing the waves and, and the opportunities for wisdom are just kind of sometimes just being hurled at you. But uh, I have chosen to be in a romantic relationship and uh, I have no complaints. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from C.O. Vaksh and Sipad Zidana. And I'm getting much better at pronouncing this. I think, I mean, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong, but at least it's rolling off the tongue more easily. So, C.O. Vaksh and Sipad Zidana says, Nagarjuna is very concerned with non-dualism and non-differentiation of things, but Vasutanipata's Dwayatanupasana Dwai, Sutta is a chapter of dualities that kind of goes completely opposite to this thinking, such as the duality of suffering and the cessation of suffering. What are your thoughts on this subject of duality versus non-duality? Well, in order to communicate, you have to use dualism. And if you're communicating to lay people or people that just aren't very highly evolved yet or they haven't cultivated more subtle like meditative states yet, um, you have to be more dualistic. You know, talk about this is good and this is bad. You should do the good and avoid the bad. And that's, that's very dualistic. And then as you get more into more and more refined states, then that kind of fades out. Also, you should bear in mind that the suttas were never intended to be uh, like an integrated, all of it mutually agreeing with each other kind of a kind of a thing. It's like the Buddha would be talking to one person and, you know, kind of using their own attitude as a way of teaching them, kind of reflecting things back to them, just kind of speaking their own lingo. And then with somebody else who might have a very different problem, he'll be he'll be talking something different. And it was the commentarial tradition that tried to integrate everything so that, you know, they have to make it all like be compatible with each other. And it's not necessarily the case. Like Ajahn Chai used to say, if if he sees someone straying too far to the left, he'll tell them to go right. And if he sees somebody straying too far to the right, he'll tell them to go left. But he hasn't just contradicted himself by telling two people opposite things. It's just that what you tell one person is suited to their own predicament. And then what you tell the next person is suited to their own predicament. And some people are just very much in duality. So you'd use a more dualistic way of teaching them. Um, and then there's one sutta that's that, this statement or this question here by C.O. Vakshya and Sipad Zidana. Um, it's the Pura Beta Sutta and the Sutta Nipata, which um, it's, it's got a lot of opposites, paired opposites. It's like, the sutta is largely based on pairs of opposites, but they're canceling each other out. 
So you got this and this, and then they cancel each other out. And then this and this, and they cancel each other out. So that might be another uh, sort of dharmic way of just bringing up duality um, as a kind of skillful means to get past duality. So I think I'll just move on to the next question by C.O. Vaksh and Sipad Zidana. And he says, you said Sankara is a thrown together term, but to me it seems to make sense as a category. The will is heavily influenced directly by habits and emotions, and hence why they are all grouped under mental formations, whereas pleasure and pain are deeper motivators of behavior and can't be changed. What do you think? Well, I don't think that Sankara is necessarily a thrown together term. I think I said it's one of the most ambiguous terms because it has so many different definitions. Like Sankara can just mean thing. I mean, it can mean anything that is conditioned. Like uh, in the three marks of existence, you've got Sabe Sankara Dukkha, Sabe Sankara Anicca, and then you've got Sabe Dhamma Anatta. So Sabe Sankara Dukkha, anything that's conditioned is conducive to suffering or is unsatisfying. And it, Sabe Sankara Anicca, you know, any conditioned thing is uh, impermanent, you know, inconstant. But Sabe Dhamma Anatta, means that it's not just with regard to conditioned things, but there's nothing at all, including Nibbana, that is the self. So, um, Sankara can have different meanings in different contexts. That's, that's mainly what I was saying. Um, but let's see, let's get a little farther here with uh, C.O. Vaksha and Sipad Zidana here. The will is heavily influenced directly by habits and emotions, and hence why they are all grouped under mental formations. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, sometimes they're all grouped under Sankara, but then again, like in the five khandas, um, like uh, Sanya Khanda or perception, technically that's a Sankara also, but it got separated out on its own. So, let's see. Pleasure and pain are deeper motivators of behavior and can't be changed. Well, the main motivator of behavior is really, it's going to be your perception and your reactions to what you experience. I mean, like in, in the dependent core rising, the, the 12 Nidana theory, there you got Vedana or, or feeling leads to Tathana or craving. And that is the link that's supposed to be broken by the, the Dhamma practitioner, where you have the feeling. And then, I mean, just having this feeling, I mean, it's, it's sort of like morally neutral. It's just what you, how you react to it is going to be moral or immoral or, or whatever. And that's going to be what, how you get off the wheel if you ever do. The wheel of samsara, I should say. So, um, yeah, according to the, the old five khanda theory of, you know, what we, what we are composed of is five khandas. Sankara there mainly means will. So it's, uh, perception has been differentiated from Sankara, and it mainly means will, although the Abhidhamma scholars may argue that. They'll say that there's like 50 or 51 other mental states included. So I think I should just move on to the next question before uh, I get so confused that everyone else is confused also. So Sio Vaksha and Sipad Zidana's next question is in the Alagadupama Sutta, which is a good sutta by the way, the Buddha says that a foolish person has views such as, quote, the self and the cosmos are one and the same, unquote, which is rejecting the Hindu idea of the Brahman. How is Nirvana different than this idea, especially when it referred to as empty and non-self as well? Be the main difference is that Brahman is reified as an existent state, at least uh, uh, in, the, I mean, the language frames it that way. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to talk about something that is unconditioned because just by calling it it, you've just turned it into a, a worldly samsaric thing. But Buddhism was much more reluctant to reify the absolute. So nirvana or nibbana is just completely off the scale. You cannot really say 
anything about it. I mean, just by calling it it, you've already just turned it into something else. It's not Nibbana anymore. So, yeah, it's the, the Upanishads saying that, um, you know, calling ultimate reality Brahman or Nirguna Brahman, which is ultimate re reality, which has no discernible characteristics. And then identifying that with the Atman or the self. Um, I mean, that's it's coming fairly close to what Buddhism teaches, except that Buddhism is just is sort of instead of saying, you know, something exists or the ultimate exists, they're just saying as little as possible because nothing you can say about it is going to be valid. To say it exists is invalid. To say that it doesn't exist is invalid. To say that it does and doesn't exist is invalid. To say that it neither exists nor doesn't exist is invalid. You just can't talk about it. And so Buddha was more interested in just teaching people how to get there rather than explaining where they're trying to go. I mean, you can use certain simple terms. You have to use some kind of terms. I mean, why would anybody want to attain nirvana if, I mean, the person who's teaching you how to get there is just refusing to say anything at all about it. So, I mean, you can say it's the cessation of suffering or it's the cessation of greed, hate, and delusion or, or whatever. It is the escape from all suffering, the escape from samsara or whatever. But um, as a general rule in Buddhism, you don't reify it. That Nibbana is completely off the scale. And the main purpose of Dhamma is not to describe the goal. It's just to tell you how to get to the goal. And a good example of, of this that, uh, that I've, I've spoken of more than once is, let's say there's somebody comes up to you, you know, there, there's some sort of hillbilly. They've never had vanilla before in their life. So they ask you, what does vanilla taste like? And I mean, you can stand there and explain and explain and explain how vanilla tastes, and they're still going to be completely clueless. In fact, I mean, if you've never tasted vanilla yourself, you can read book after book after book, you can do chemical analyses, you can do all this stuff, you still don't know what vanilla tastes like. Unless, I mean, you're, you're having like artificial vanilla flavoring or something, but that's cheating. So... If someone wants to know what vanilla tastes like, then the best thing they can do is just find some vanilla and taste it. So if somebody comes up to you and asks you what vanilla tastes like, I mean, you can just waste your time trying to explain it to them, which I mean, it's just gonna be futile, or you can just tell them how to get some vanilla and to taste it for themselves. And that's pretty much what Buddhism is doing. And it's keeping the attempted descriptions of Nibbana down to a, an absolute minimum. And even then it's really, um, it should not be considered a thing or an it or even a state. I mean, it's just completely off the scale. And what the Upanishads are trying to describe is essentially the same thing, in my opinion. I think that the, the sages who wrote, who composed the Upanishads and the sages who composed the most profound Buddhist texts were attempting to explain the same thing from two different perspectives. So at least there is that. And so I guess I should just move on to the next question, also from Sio Vaksh and Sipat Zidana. And it's right here. Nagarjuna says that things are empty because they only exist due to causes and links the idea of dependent origination and emptiness together. However, if Nirvana is unconditioned and without a cause, then how can it also be empty and without self? Well, it's a different kind of emptiness. <sighs> or you can just say that, I mean, going with Nagarjuna, I mean, Nirvana is, is like the underlying reality of samsara. And that's why the Mahayana Buddhists say that ultimately Nirvana and samsara are the same. That nirvana would be sort of like the essence of samsara, and samsara would be like the the apparent form of nirvana. But uh, yeah, I mean, Nagarjuna says that things are empty because they only exist due to causes. But I mean, he's not even saying that they exist. He, he's it's like they they appear to exist. They seem to exist due to seeming causes, and. Uh, and then, link, and then he links the idea of dependent origination and emptiness together. Yeah, so emptiness is just emptiness of any self-essence. 
And that's true of Nirvana because he's dealing with reality. I mean, reality is, is devoid of self essence. So that applies to Nirvana. And like I already said earlier, it's, it's sabe dhamma anatta, which means it's not just worldly things, it's not just samsaric phenomena that are not self, it's absolutely anything including Nibbana is without self. So I'll just move on to the next question from Siovaksh and Sipad Zidna. And he says, I assume it's a he, it's not really a, a girl name, I'm pretty sure. In the Sabhasava Sutta, the Buddha rejects the idea of self, no self, self feeling there is no self, and no self feeling like a self. And then he's got a quote. When they attend improperly in this way, one of the six, the following six views arises in them and is taken as a genuine fact. The view myself exists in an absolute sense. The view myself does not exist in an absolute sense. The view I perceive the self with the self. The view I perceive what is not self with the self. The view I perceive the self with what is not self." Unquote. I always thought that he was saying there is no self and it only feels like we have a self, but based on this sutta, that is incorrect. Can you please explain the nuances of this issue? Well, in all of these, it's like, it's it's still I me mean, mine. So it's like, no, my, the view myself does not exist in an absolute sense. I mean, it's still referring to myself. I mean, it's still referring to a me, even though it's like this me that, that I identify with is not, absolutely real you know i perceive what is not self self it's still i am perceiving it so any kind of trying to sneak an, an i or a me in through the back door um is, is is out but let's see yeah i mean self and no self i mean you can you you could argue that it's sort of like it's all invalid, like Nibbana itself, where, you know, if, if the Atman and Brahman are the same in, for the, in the Upanishads, then, I mean, it would be kind of the same in Buddhism, where the, instead of Brahman, you've got Nibbana or Nirvana, and you can't really say that it exists or doesn't exist. I mean, it's just, you don't reify it. And then by the same token, the self would have to be the same way. So... It's, it is kind of a tough question. It's, it's a subtle question, very nuanced, as Sio Vaksh and Sipad Zidana himself uh, states here. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just even referring to the self, just thinking about, um, you know, what am I really, that kind of a thing, is, is discouraged in, in Theravada Buddhism. I mean, you just shouldn't even go there. So I'll just move on to uh, CEO of Action, Sipad Zidana's next question. And hopefully I didn't uh, bungle that last one too badly. In the Chula Malukya, Put In the Chula Malukya Sutta and other places, why did the Buddha refuse to answer the question whether the self and the body are one and the same? The idea of the five khandas clearly rejects that idea, so it's confusing. I heard some other people say it was actually asking about the mind-body problem and the body refusing to answer that, but I don't know. In another video, you say many Buddhist traditions have different views on this, like Sarvasti Vada, both are real and different, Yogacara, only mind exists, Majamaka, neither exists, etc. If you interpret this question like that, seems these schools have places their bets on something the Buddha refused to answer. Well, one thing that should be borne in mind is the Buddha said there's no self, but with regard to these questions that he wouldn't answer, the word that's sometimes referred to as self or soul is jiva, it's not atta. So it's a different word, and jiva literally means life. So it could be that they're simply referring to the life force. You know, is the life force the same as the body, or the, the life, is your life the same as your body, or, or different from the body? Um, I mean, it could be interpreted that way. I've, I've interpreted it that way sometimes, just as a way of trying to wrap my head around it. Um, but it, it really is two different words that are both being translated as self or soul. Uh, usually, 
it's atta, you know, anatta, there is no self. But in these questions that the Buddha wouldn't answer, it's jiva, which means life. Although it is true that some groups like the Jains use the word jiva as soul. So it, it's kind of kind of ambiguous. And it's it could be that um, this is another case of um, different suttas coming from you know, different perspectives, possibly different ancient monasteries or, or some such, where, um, you know, it's not all of a piece. It's not all perfectly logically consistent because, uh, or partly because, the Buddha is just talking to different people and they've got their own issues and he's sort of tailoring what he's saying to, to suit their own predicament. Uh, let's see. Self and the body are one and the same. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's generally those. That's that's my best answer. So I'd better just move on to the next question here. Also, this is Co Vaksh and Sipad Zidana's last question here. Can you explain how to practice sense restraint? I never seen anyone explain it without saying it is different than just being uh, an avoidant prude and moving on. I don't understand how we practice sense restraint. Well, the way I was taught, if you're practicing sense restraint, it doesn't mean you're just like closing your eyes and putting your hands over your ears and just not sensing anything. It means that if you hear something, you just hear it as sound. You're not like trying to identify it or categorize it. You know, there's a dog barking out the window, then you just hear it as sound. You know, you're just experiencing the sensation of of the sound you know interacting with your ear and your auditory lobes and all that um you're not thinking oh that's a dog barking out there and it's the same way with like your visual field you're just experiencing as as close to unprocessed data as you can you know you're not slapping labels onto it you're not thinking about it you're not spinning off with trains of association it just is what it is you're not attributing significance to it. You're experiencing it fully. You know, you're still hearing, you're still seeing and everything, but you're not interpreting what you are sensing. You know, it's just sound, it's just vision, it's smell, it's, it's taste, it's, it's touch, whatever. So that's how you practice sense restraint. It's, you just, you experience the senses, but you're not, just running with it. You're not like spinning off into chains of association and that sort of thing. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Raphael46, also known as Rafi46. And Raphael46 says, Did you know that the founder of the Tibetan Galug school, Jaitsung Kappa, recommended tantric sex with 12 year old girls? The Dalai Lama is part of this school. The goal is to attain Nibbana with this ritual. Of course, most Western Buddhists are unaware of this. Yeah, and when I first learned about this, it was a long time ago. I read about it in a Ram Das book where he's saying that these girls are trained from childhood to be able to have sex with no emotional involvement whatsoever so that the whole thing is done as a kind of meditation where the man is lying motionless, trying not to do anything, and the girl is over the top of him, and she's like been trained not to be emotionally involved. And I just, I just read about it as just this tantric practice. I don't think that it's considered to be essential to enlightenment to do this kind of stuff, and I assume it's relatively rare. Um, it might be accepted as, you know, a possible way of practicing but I, whether the Dalai Lama himself has done this sort of thing, I have no idea. And uh, I mean, it's the way Tantra works. Tantra believes that we are in the Kali Yuga, that we are in the spiritual dark age. It's not even possible to be like a fully perfected saint. And so you have to use like the corruption of the world as grist for the mill, so to speak. And so they eat meat and they, they drink alcohol and, you know, they do these things that generally would be considered um, bad karma or demeritorious. And they're trying to 
like purify it just by having as pure of mental states as they can manage while doing these things. And of course, most people fail miserably and they just wallow in it. And it is dangerous. And I think they fully admit that it's, it's difficult to do and it's very dangerous, but um, they do it anyway. So I think I'll just move on to Raphael 46's uh, next question. And that is, have you studied Sion Buddhism or ever had contact with Korean monks? Sion Buddhism, is that like the, the Korean version of Zen? Because I'm, I remember reading a book by a Korean monk who had Sion in his name. So, I mean, could it be just this tradition that he founded? In which case, I read the book and uh, all that I remember is him referring to um, like subatomic particles as microscopic, but we can just attribute that to his lack of uh, mastery of the English language, I suppose. Ah, but um, yeah, Korean Zen, I don't know much about. I haven't really studied it. I have interacted with one Korean monk, especially. I spent two months at Pandita Rama back around 1997 the winter of 97, 98, if I remember correctly. And there was this um, Mahayana Buddhist monk, a Korean, wearing the gray pajamas. And uh, he and I talked a little bit. I mean, we both had a, a great respect for Nagarjuna, for example. He was saying that uh, some Korean monks consider Nagarjuna to be like a second Buddha. Um, and he was... I mean, he would have like these, uh, what's the word? Oh, what's that art where you, it's like you're, you're doing like Salvador Dali, this, uh, uh, the word is escaping me. But I mean, he was having these weird dreamlike meditations and he was considered to be a really good meditator by Upandita, who was the, doing the meditation interviews. And I'd just be having these completely pedestrian kind of, kind of uh, meditation experiences and and Upandita in the Seattle was not impressed at all and then this Korean monk would be talking about how he's just floating on air and seeing molecules and germs and everything is breaking up into atoms and just going on and on about this kind of stuff and um, I mean he could just sit like a statue for like three hours in the in the full lotus position too so but I, I do think that um, yeah, he was just uh, very faith oriented, I think. And uh, yeah, I really, I really can't, uh, can't judge his meditation experiences though. But he was the only Korean monk that I ever really got to know. And uh, with regard to Sion Buddhism, I really, I really can't spit, I really can't say. So I'll just move on to the next question from uh, Raphael 46. And he says, recently saw a video of a monk from Sri Lanka punching a missionary in the face. What consequences does this monk face and what happens if he keeps doing this act and does not regret it? Well, this is kind of weird. It's, um, it is against the rules for a monk to punch a layperson in the face, but it's a minor rule. It's just a dukkha. It's like the, the lowest level of offense, like to punch another monk that's a Pachidia offense, which is sort of mid-level with regard to the severity of, of the breaking the rules. But to punch a layperson is, is just a, a very minor offense, which is kind of strange. But um, this, like the heaviness of the karma doesn't necessarily match up with the heaviness of the rule. So you can do some things that um, you know, are trivial and break a relatively serious rule, like building a hut that's, that's not the correct size it's too big or something you know you haven't necessarily done anything evil but i mean that's a relatively serious rule whereas like punching a layperson in the nose um could be uh considered a much worse thing to do but it's it's just a, a very minor rule to break but um what consequence does this monk face and what happens if he keeps doing this act and does not regret it well i mean you're making the karma i mean maybe in a Maybe in the future he's going to get punched in the face, and that'll that'll like pay off the karmic debt. Um, if he keeps doing this act and does not regret it, well, I mean the regret is irrelevant um, from the from point of view of Theravada Buddhism. Regret or kukucha 
is always bad karma. So, um, I mean, you can admit that you did something wrong and try to rectify it, you know, try to do better in the future. That's good. But um, regretting having a guilty conscience, that kind of a thing, it's just it just makes things worse. So, I mean, he's just going to keep making karma, which presumably would be about the same severity as what he's dishing out. So he might get beaten up pretty good if he just keeps going around uh, punching missionaries. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if he doesn't have any kind of, uh, um, if he doesn't acknowledge that he's done anything wrong, then, yeah, he's, I don't think he's, he's going to make very much progress. So I'll just move on to Raphael 46's next question. What do you think about Buddha Dasa? I like how he wanted to make lay people into monks. He once said that ideally a couple should stay celibate during their marriage. Well, Buddha Dasa, if this is the Buddha Dasa that um, I'm aware of, is as a Thai Ajahn, and I really don't know much about Thai Ajahns. Very few. I mean, I've read the biography of Ajahn Mun, for example. I know, you know, a certain amount about Ajahn Cha because he's the most famous of all the Thai monks. Um, but Buddha Dasa, yeah, it's it's possible that an Australian monk very long ago gave me a book for, of Buddha Dasa's sermons. I think maybe it was Buddha Dasa, just as a joke, just to show how Thai monks really don't know Pali and they use the, the words wrong and stuff. But um, aside from that, I really don't know much about Ajahn Buddha Dasa, if this is even the same Buddha Dasa that I'm thinking of. Um, wanting to make lay people into monks, I don't, I don't even understand that. It sounds kind of Protestant to me. And then he once said that ideally a couple should stay celibate during their marriage. That would be like Orthodox Theravada. Um, like Anatta Pindika was a, a Buddhist saint and he was married, but I think he was celibate and his wife presumably was as well. So, yeah, this is kind of an easy question for me to answer because I can just say I don't know because I'm really not familiar with him. So I'll just move on to Raphael 46's next question. Does a Buddhist create bad karma by following the five precepts only out of selfishness rather than idealism? He does these things only because he wants to enjoy his next life, not because he cares about others or understands the compassion behind these precepts. Well, I mean, Buddhist ethics are so finely tuned that it's virtually impossible to get only good karma when you do something. That, um, you know, so long as you even think that you are doing it, then there's delusion involved. In fact, and so long as you're not enlightened yet, there's going to be delusion involved, which is going to be a certain amount of bad karma mixed in. So does a Buddhist create bad karma by following the five precepts only out of selfishness? Um, yeah, he's, I mean, hopefully he'll be making more good karma than bad. So, I mean, he'll be making good karma too. And just depending on how corrupt and depraved the mental states are will determine you know, how much good karma, how much bad karma is, is going into the mix. So, yeah, it may be that one starts off, um, like, doing meritorious deeds just because one wants to get into the golden palace with the 500 celestial nymphs in heaven after one dies. And then gradually as one progresses, because, I mean, every act has its results, you know, if you're, if you're living a moral life and meditating, even though if originally it's for bad reasons, your, your wisdom is going to progress. And so your reasons are gradually going to progress also and get better. So, yeah, let's just hope that he's doing it in such a way that at least he's making good, more good karma than bad. And so I'll move on to Raphael 46's next question. And that is as follows. Some monks who handle money justify this by saying that only handling gold is bad, but not paper money. What is your opinion on this? Well, the monks who say that are just ignorant of the rule, because the rule is uh, Jata Rupa Rajata, which it's, it means gold or silver. And then at least, I mean, in the, the Pali itself, it, it explains 
when it, when it explains the rule, it's referring to anything that can be used as currency. So, I mean, like copper pennies, it's still money. It's not gold or silver, but it's still money. Paper money is still money. Um, there are some monks in modern times who um, they'll say, well, like a debit card or something isn't exactly money. And, uh, you know, like the, there's some other person or they, they use a credit card and you've got some other person who is paying off the bills so that the monk technically isn't handling money. But still, I mean, that's, it's just kind of cheating. And like even some relatively strict monks, they're, they're abbots and they're like signing checks or endorsing checks. You know, they're just endorsing the back. But even so, the check itself says pay to the order too. And so they're like endorsing an order to do something with money. And that's, that's just as much against the rules as handling the money themselves. There are more and more subtle ways of using money without actually handling it nowadays. But the best bet of a monk who really wants to be strict is just have nothing to do with it. I've read three different explanations of the money rules by three different Western monks. And all of them were essentially writing, you know, how how much can a, a monk handle money without actually breaking the rules? You know, like where where exactly where is the line that he can just get right up to before he stops and not break the rule? Because people, I mean, not handling money can be very inconvenient for a monk. I have to admit, especially if you're on like going through foreign airports and stuff. <sighs> Let's see. So. Yeah, I mean, that's just a bogus argument. I mean, it says quite clearly in the poly that uh, anything that can be used as money counts as gold and silver. So I'll just move on to Raphael 46's next question, which is, should the rule of sleeping only four hours a night be changed? If you sleep for less than six hours, you can face multiple repercussions like cardiovascular problems, depression, and weight gain. Well, there is no rule saying that you're only allowed to sleep for four hours. It's just recommended that a monk would sleep only one watch of the night. The night is divided up into three watches, you know, first, second, and third, and a monk should sleep only one of those. And if you assume that, you know, half of a 24 hour period is night, then that comes out to four hours. And, um, yeah, I mean, here's, if you sleep for less than six hours, you can face multiple repercussions like cardiovascular problems. Yeah, you sit in the full lotus for hours, you can get problems with that too. You stay celibate, you get problems with that. You know, just, just being a monk, like, like I was saying earlier, it can cause like strain and imbalances in your body. And that's just the price that you pay to, to live this spiritual lifestyle. Um, but I have found that uh, if you're doing intensive meditation, you just don't need as much sleep. So it's sort of like some of the, the functions of sleep are also fulfilled just through sitting there in a, in a chilled out alert state, but not thinking. It's like maybe your brain just has to take some kind of a break from certain kinds of thinking. I have, I have read that your mind is actually more active when you're asleep, especially when you're dreaming than when you're awake. But um, yeah, there, there is no rule uh, that needs to be changed. And uh, yeah, some, some people just don't need much sleep. I've, I've been a real sleepyhead. Before I was a monk, I, was, I used to say if I didn't get nine hours sleep in the morning, or if I didn't get nine hours sleep, I'd be a bear in the morning. So, but then I, I was trying to get down, but really only one month in my entire life as, especially as a monk, but I mean, my entire life, uh, was I able to average less than four hours sleep per night for an entire month? And I was, that was some of the most intense, intensive meditation I'd ever done. And I really didn't need much more sleep than that. But if I wasn't meditating, I could just could not do it. It was only when my meditation was going good and I was doing it intensively that I could get by on, on four hours or less of sleep per night uh, for a prolonged period. So I'll just move on to Raphael 46's last question. <clears throat> and that is, does a monk have to cover both of his shoulders when he gets in contact with lay people? Nope, he doesn't. He only has to cover both shoulders when he's in public 
which means if he is in a public place, like in a village or in a town, but inside the monastery, he can interact with lay people and have one shoulder uncovered or even not wear an upper robe at all. He can have both sh shoulders and his chest and his belly uncovered if he's out in the forest or he's inside the monastery. But if he's outside the monastery in a public place, you know, among the houses, then he has to keep both shoulders covered. So I'll just move on to the next question, which is from Diane. And Diane says, is it inevitable that everyone has to suffer? Uh, yeah, although some people suffer more than others. I mean, some people are fortunate and their suffering is, you know, their, their dog dies or, you know, they, they get catch a cold, you know, they get a toothache when they're 16. You know, it's like <clears throat> you can have relatively, you can have a happy, healthy family and everything, but still there's, there's going to be stuff that happens and happiness and unhappiness are just two sides of the same coin. They're, they're going to balance out in the long run. So if you have pleasure that you don't detach from, you enjoy, you know, the way dinner tastes and so forth, it's going to be balanced out by, by something else, maybe a little bit of indigestion or just being hungry. Maybe you were hungry before then and you weren't satisfied by being hungry, you know, or, or whatever. So it, there's always going to be a, a balance of suffering and, and, and like pleasure and, and displeasure. And as I say, monks try to go, just go the route of neutrality and try to keep both to a minimum. But yeah, it's, it's the, the first noble truth of Buddhism is that if you exist, you're going to suffer even that the gods in heaven are, are experiencing some dukkha or, or unhappiness for various reasons. It's just more subtle there. But I mean, it's, it's just a matter of degree. I mean, there are some people in this world that are already in a hell realm. And then there are some people that are relatively fortunate, you know, they're sort of like low level, small G gods. But it is true that nobody is perfectly happy and there's nothing in the entire universe that has the ability to uh, completely satisfy us. And in fact, you can say that it's like this restless dissatisfaction that is just pushing us through life from one moment to the next. So I'll just move on to the next question, which is the last question. And this is from Erin. And Erin says... What is the Buddhist attitude towards the whole right-wing Alpha Chad Bro mimetic movement, which includes bodybuilding, superficial self-improvement, self-responsibility, etc.? <clears throat> is there a dharmic way of going about it, or is it just macho narcissism? Well, let's see here. The Buddhist attitude towards the whole right-wing Alpha Chad Bro mimetic movement. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's outward acts are karmically neutral for the most part. It's just the mental states that accompany um, the acts that really are making the karma and determining like the, uh, the ethical value, positive or negative of the of the behavior. And so like bodybuilding, working out in a gym, I mean, if you're just doing it to look buff to attract women, or just to, to bolster your ego, then yeah, that's, that would be a uh, demerit or, or bad karma mixed in. If you're doing it just for the sake of being healthy and strong, then even that is going to have a little bit of bad karma, just the delusion of I exist, you know, I mean, mine kind of stuff. Um, Self-responsibility, I mean, that's in itself is, uh, I think that would be a, a virtuous uh, attitude, self-responsibility. Although again, some people go about it skillfully, other people go about it unskillfully. You know, self-responsibility, if, if you're just like jacked up with, you know, hatred of, of like the invaders trying to destroy our country and the, the, the corrupt rulers who are trying to destroy the civilization and all this on and on and on. If you're just sort of chronically <clears throat> angry or hateful, then you're going to be motivated by anger and hate and, and it's just going to poison the well, essentially. And it is true, I've noticed a lot of just hard right-wingers tend to be sort of dour, 
angry people without much sense of humor. And not all of them, but hopefully not most of them. But like some of the real radical right wingers, uh, they, they do have a certain negativity just kind of built in. And they may justify the negativity as uh, necessary or appropriate or something. But from the Buddhist point of view, negativity is still negativity. Um, let's see. So is there a dharmic way of going about it or is it just macho nar narcissism? Yeah, there's, there's a dharmic way of going about it if you're just doing it out of a sense of, of duty and, and just, you know, desire for health and strength and, and just being an upstanding person who is able to do his part in society, um, being self-sufficient and so forth, that's fine. So, yeah, it depends on the, the, the mental states of the individual who's doing the thing. And that is, was the last question. And I kind of answered them more quickly than usual. Usually this thing stretches out to like two hours. So yeah, I was speedy. And if you have any questions, you're very welcome to ask. Just leave them in the comments below. Or if you have access to my Subscribestar channel, you can ask them there. If you have access to the Discord server, you can ask them there. And uh, hit like if you please. Subscribe if you haven't already. Look at the URL links below, including the books that I have written, and be happy.